Well, there is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Nicholas Veron is a senior fellow at Bruegel, a Brussels-based policy center, and the Peterson Institute for International Economics right here in Washington, D.C. Zhao Hai is a research fellow with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. And joining us from Paris is Nicolas Casarini. He's the head of Asia research at the Istituto Affari Antonazionali, an Italian think tank. And I do hope I pronounced that correctly. But Nicola Casarini, let me start with you. There's a lot of controversy over what is uh, taking place right now with this memorandum of understanding that's just about to be signed. There are, have been complaints from the United States, from the European Union. There are divisions within Italy as well. Uh, but the bottom line is, what does Italy stand to gain by signing up to China's Belt and Road Initiative? Well, Italy stands to gain economically and politically. Economically, three things. Market access in China for made in Italy products and Italian companies, but also investments, Silk Road investments in infrastructure, but also across the board. And finally, Italy hopes a commitment by China to continue purchase Italian bonds, especially in a situation, as reminded by the journalists before, of weakness in the economic situation in Italy, which, could, uh, which we could presage turbulence in international markets in the future. Politically, also, to have some uh, strong financial power like China closer to Italy. This will become enormously important in the future, as Italy will probably encounter financial problems once the new budget law will be discussed in the next month. Right. Nicholas Veron, both the European Union, as I mentioned, and the United States are expressing grave misgivings over this growing relationship between Italy and China. Uh, what the United States is saying is that this will extend China's influence in Italy, in Europe in general. Uh, the European Commission has called China a, quote, systemic rival. But the question is, does Italy have a choice here? Its ports need developing. It needs infrastructure. Uh, uh, money for infrastructure development. Are there other countries rushing to plug those holes? Yeah, Italy does have a choice. Uh, this is also uh, linked to the political uh, orientation of the current Italian government. A different government would probably have uh, done things differently. And as your uh, correspondent did remind us, there is also a, a very strong internal debate in Italy, including inside the government, on whether this is the right way to go. Uh, so Italy definitely has a choice. There are other ways to sell its debt, to develop its infrastructure, but that doesn't mean that the uh, support for the Belt and Road Initiative is a bad idea or that uh, bad things have to come out of it. So I think things are in play, and it's very important to understand that the objections from the U.S. are very different from the objections from the European Union. We may uh, perhaps come back to this later on, but the U.S. has kind of a general hostility to the Belt and Road Initiative. The European Union is much more nuanced. I think they can see some good things coming out of it, but they don't want it to become a trap for EU policies. You mentioned that the EU listed China as a strategic rival, but actually if you re read the full sentence mm -hmm. of the document, it's much more balanced. Uh, the European Union says that uh, China is a partner, it's a peer, it's also a strategic rival, but it's a, it's a very balanced assessment because uh, clearly there are issues on which Europe and China uh, don't see eye to eye, some aspects of political uh, democracy, rule of law, what uh, kind of regimes to promote in the world. But there are also a lot of uh, synergies and, uh, and issues where the EU and China are very close. The Paris Accord on climate fighting climate change is a very good example. Also preserving the world trade system, the WTO, where the European Union and China in many ways are on the same side of a discussion where the US is on the other side. So things are more complicated. And I think it's very important, especially for uh, an international audience to understand the difference of perceptions of the Belt and Road Initiative in the European Union, on the one hand, uh, in the US, on the other hand. Okay, let me bring in uh, from The Hague in the Netherlands, let me bring in Ju Wong. She focuses on the Economy and Belt and Road Initiative as an assistant professor at Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. Ju Wong, welcome to the show. Uh, we're looking at well, Italy's uh, decision to sign this memorandum of understanding with China. Italy is in a recession right now. Foreign direct investment has dropped by more than half since 2007. And as we've been reporting, the country's infrastructure needs upgrading. So how will this Belt and Road Initiative, this understanding that it's signing, help Italy? Well, um, first of all, 
Um, like you mentioned earlier, the um, foreign, uh, foreign investment has dropped since uh, the global financial crisis. Um, uh, that happens to uh, several uh, European countries, including Italy. So in the past uh, decade, Italy has been uh, actively pursue um, opportunity to, to increase investment both from domestic source and uh, uh, from external source. And I think uh, um, uh, setting up this relationship with China will indeed bring opportunities for foreign direct investment investment from China, um, uh, investment in all, all sorts of sectors, for example, in the infrastructure, uh, including um, uh, it, this time when the President Xi Jinping visits uh, Italy, um, he will very likely, um, his visit will very likely lead to the sign, um, signing contract of uh, uh, two uh, ports in the north part of Italy with the Chinese companies for future development and also includes the signing up of uh, um, uh, contracts in other sectors like uh, finance, um, agriculture, um, uh, technology, uh, cultural industry, etc. So I think this definitely brings uh, um, investment opportunity for Italy. And also, um, as Italian politician also proposed, that this would be a um, good opportunity to uh, promote Italian products, Italian exports to China uh, to meet the needs of a rising middle class in China. Um, well, it, Italian products are already popular in China, so they want to take this opportunity to sell more uh, Italian goods in China. Zhao yeah, hi. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, he's been talking about this. Of course, he's going to be there for the signing. He's been talking about the potential for the two countries. Uh, let's listen to part of what he had to say. We agreed that we need to strengthen synergies between the two parties and our respective development strategies to enhance collaboration in infrastructure, ports, logistics and shipping. The goal is to build concrete and quality projects along the Belt and Road. So, Zhao we've heard what Italy gets out of this, but what does China get out of it? Well, first of all, President Xi Jinping chose uh, Italy and another two European countries as his first trip going overseas this year. I think that shows how China value the importance of Europe. And number two, Italy uh, will join uh, the, uh, well, hopefully will join, uh, sign the MOU and join the Belt and Road Initiative. And China hope to uh, find Italy a valuable partner in European countries, as well as, you know, if you think about it, Italy is also one of the, one of the G7 uh, uh, members. So I think it's important to think this from a strategic perspective, not only from an economic perspective. Well, at the same time, uh, you have the panelists mentioned that the United States is quite hostile at this point against the Belt and Road Initiative. And there's a lot of misunderstanding and misperception around the world. So I think at this juncture that Italy chose to uh, trust and uh, participate in the Belt and Road Initiative is very supportive to China. And China is willing to cooperate in many areas that you mentioned before uh, to, with, with Italy at this point. Nicola Casarini, despite all the criticism that's been leveled uh, from uh, parts of uh, the European Union as well as Washington uh, at Italy, uh, Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte, he's defending this agreement, uh, and here's what he had to say. The framework for the Belt and Road Memorandum between Italy and China is primarily economic and commercial. It does not put our national interest at risk and is fully in line with the European Union strategy, promoting it as no other state has done in its dealings with Beijing. So, Nicola Casarini, the uh, Prime Minister is certainly in favour of the New Deal, but there are divisions, political divisions in Italy. The Interior Minister, Matteo Salvini, says these things pose a national security risk. What risks is he talking about here? But first of all, the Prime Minister said economic and um, commercial reasons. But Salvini, as you mentioned, thinks differently. So Salvini, like the other people in the Italian government that have understand the Belt and Road Initiative also is a way for China to promote a form of globalization with the Chinese characteristics, are aware of the United States being unhappy about that. So the risk would be, for instance, in critical infrastructures, ports, telecommunications, energy sector. Uh, Italy is part of NATO, and there are a lot of NATO assets. Uh, let's remember that already in Trieste and Genoa, there will be uh, U.S. 
uh, navies uh, that sometimes uh, arrive there and use the facilities. So which means Italy, by signing up to the Belt and Road Initiative, does take the decision to get closer to China in a situation where Italy remains a pillar of the NATO and the Transatlantic Alliance. That's why this junior partner of the coalition, the League, has, has raised concerns, also because Salvini wants to be seen pro-NATO, pro-United States, and he is likely to become the next prime minister if this government crumbles at a certain point. So that's why he's like launching this kind of like messages of trying to be close to the United States, raising issues about the critical infrastructure and the, the risk for national security. They're all messages addressed to the Trump administration because he's getting ready to become the next prime minister. Nicholas Varon, is too much being read into this? I mean, how much of a game changer is it in terms of, well, we know the economic changes that take place, in terms of strategic changes? Yeah, I think it's very much about strategy, and the uh, Prime Minister may say it's all economic, no strategic uh, uh, thinking in there, but obviously there is a lot of strategic positioning there. I actually believe the most uh, critical question is what is China's strategy vis-a-vis -vis the European Union? Does China want to be seen in the European Union as trying to undermine EU unity or working together with the European Union and with countries inside the European Union, such as Italy, mm -hmm. in a joined up way? So that's a big ch question for China. China has yeah. been a big ambiguous until now. They have a relationship at the European Union, Union level, also at the level of individual countries, but it's not very coordinated. So I think you know these are early days for the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. It's a long-term project. Yeah. But I think the biggest question for China, and it's really a question for China even more than it is for Europe, is do they want their Belt and Road uh, Initiative strategy in Europe to be integrated at the European level, or do they want to be seen as picking and choosing individual partners at the risk of this being seen as hostile to EU integration? That's a difficult question, I think, for the Chinese leaders. Right, but Nicholas Brown, as you've pointed out, there are areas where China and the European Union cooperate uh, with each other. Climate change, as you pointed out, issues concerning the WTO. There are a number of countries uh, which have joined the AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is something that was started by China. Uh, so this tells us that the memorandum of understanding may be something symbolic, but if you look at beyond that, there's a lot of countries that have a close relationship with China. My own view, for what it's worth, is that there is absolutely no antagonism between the vision of a good relationship between China and the European Union right. on the one hand, and the Belt and Road Initiative on the other hand. But for that to work well, for this to be friendly all around, I think there has to be a component of the Belt and Road strategy at the European level, and not just picking and choosing individual member states. That's a decision for China. But I would expect China would favor that as well, right? There is no indication yet of it, but uh, I would welcome that, and I think many Europeans would. Zhao Hai, the Chinese foreign ministry has called the U.S. position uh, on this, the statements that the U.S. has been making. They have called it, and I'm quoting here, laughable. That's uh, after the White House warned that Italy's image would suffer if it signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, what do you make of these deep reservations that are being expressed by the United States? Well, I think it's unfounded. And also, I think China's position towards the EU is quite clear. As President Xi has already expressed uh, with, uh, during his meeting with the president of Italy, that China respected uh, EU's integration and uh, China is trying to uh, have a good relationship with the EU as a whole. So I think China has been quite consistent in supporting EU and has a consistent policy on the EU level. And in terms of uh, in, you know, the signing B, uh, BRI MOUs with individual countries and trying to enlist the countries to uh, uh, be more actively participate in the program, I don't think that's a harmful towards uh, China's relation, bi bilateral relations between China and EU. Uh, on the other hand, actually, that will enhance the ability of EU to uh, be in a better position to integrate itself. For instance, you've also, uh, I mean, people mentioned that Italy's economy is uh, uh, declining, there's a recession coming, and uh, if Italy, by participating in B B BIR and uh, also improve its economic conditions, isn't that uh, supposed to be good for the EU's integration and economic prospect? So I think it's really 
uh, a one-sided thinking from the United States and also from some people in the EU trying to right. doubt that China has a second thought about uh, you know, EU and trying to undermine EU uh, by uh, you know, contacting with I individual countries. But Jaha, you know, what do you make of the point that Nicholas Veron just made? It would, not, would it not be in China's interest to sign up to this deal, this be a Belt and Road Initiative deal, with the EU as a group rather than just choose countries within the group? Well, the BRI is not a one-party show. China cannot decide uh, what EU could do. And uh, right. it, because uh, you've also, also mentioned there's division within the EU and some people in the EU trying to uh, side with the U.S. and try to emphasize the security side, uh, the security concern of the BRI. So if they cannot reach a consistency, consistent uh, answer towards the, the BRI and consistent policy towards BRI, then I think it's good for other countries who want to be more actively participating in the program to join first, and then others will see the results and be more willing to participate. And, and they will have a better understanding of China's intentions and the consequences of uh, working with China and cooperating with China. Ju Wong, if we look at how uh, different people are responding to this in Italy, um, what do you make of the domestic pressures that Italy is facing as it embarks on this, I guess, new relationship with China? Um, well, okay, so we are talking about um, Italy's, uh, the possibility of Italy becoming more uh, active in participating in uh, BRI projects. Uh, there have been um, criticism of uh, uh, some of the China-led China projects or, or specifically Chinese state-owned enterprise-led projects um, uh, being not very uh, transparent or uh, not having very clear tendering system, or um, uh, not particularly clear with uh, how it deals with the labor issues, deals with uh, um, uh, social or environmental um, impacts, and uh, some of the BRI deals, some BRI projects are not going very well. So some of these uh, concerns um, uh, 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 are true, uh, exist. So I think that creates a concern for the um, Italian business uh, uh, community. So what uh, joining BRI projects mean for Italian business? Are we going to um, benefit enough? Um, what will these projects bring to Italian business? So I think um, all these projects are still in the process of uh, um, uh, uh, growing in the process of uh, uh, gaining um, uh, more um, experience and the profits. So while this kind of concern exists and grow, I think it also creates opportunity to uh, really join these projects, to work together, to figure out how Italy can bring better practice into BI projects, which might turn out to be a good thing for the Chinese partners as well. Nicola Casarini, the European Union will be holding uh, talks and discussions about the relationship with China in the coming days. What do you expect will come out of these discussions? Yes, that's an important point. But before, just like uh, uh, referring to what uh, the previous speaker was saying, the game changer here is the memorandum of understanding which is being signed between Italy and China. Why? Because we're talking here about a second generation, that's how I call it, a second generation MOU, which contains, for the first time, clear language consistent with the uh, European Union strategy for connectivity in the Euro Asia region, for instance, published in September 2018, which is consistent with uh, Western norms and principles. So the memorandum of understanding, being of so-called second generation, a new one, opens up new possibilities also for the European Union. Now, the mistake that the Italian government has made this time is not to sign the Memorandum of Understanding of Second Generation, which is an upgrade compared to other MOUs signed by China with other partners and countries. The mistake made by the Italian government was not to have enough negotiations, discussions, at least information provided to European allies as well as the United States. That was the mistake. Let's remember what the United Kingdom did in 2015. They did join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but they did inform the Obama administration. The Obama administration was not happy, but accepted that after being informed many times by the UK. After the UK joined, also Germany, France, and Italy joined. So the idea could have been, had it been done in a more strategic way, 
Italy joining with France, Germany and the UK and possibly afterwards by the EU. But by Italy deciding to sign up to the Belt and Road Initiative alone, that was the big mistake because as we will see on Tuesday, Macron has invited Angela Merkel and Juncker to meet with Xi Jinping. This is a clear message sent to Italy and a clear message sent to a government which has preferred to uh, develop bilateral ties with China instead of Europeanized ties. And I fully agree with Nicolas, the French speaker in studio in Washington, that the only way for both the European Union and China to fully develop the Belt and Road Initiative in the old continent, in the European continent, is to, at a certain point, come to an understanding of what Europe as a whole and China as a whole want to achieve by developing uh, one day together this massive infrastructure and connectivity project. So to finish, that was a big mistake by Italy and Macron, Angela Merkel and Juncker by meeting together with uh, Xi Jinping are underlining to the rest of Europe uh, this big mistake. Nicholas, what do you make of that? Is the problem here the fact that Italy has not shared information with the European Union? I think uh, there's a lot of overlap between what we're uh, saying, apparently. The, the economic logic of Europe participating in the Belt and Road, Italy participating in the Belt and Road in there, uh, is completely compelling. And as Mr. High uh, reminded us, uh, Italy needs those investments, whether financed by China or other sources. Uh, it, needs, uh, it needs growth, it needs development. So all this is not controversial. What is uh, obviously a matter of discussion is how do we organize the discussion? And clearly here, it's, there's no way that this can go well if there is not a minimum of coordination on the European side. That's a matter for the Europeans to achieve, for the individual governments, as Mr. Casarini just uh, reminded us, but also a matter for China to adapt to the European landscape, which can be a bit complex, to understand it, and to be constructive uh, both at the national and the European level for all this to work well. Zhu Wang, we have the Chinese president, Xi Jinping. He himself will be there to sign this memorandum of understanding. Uh, what does this tell us about the importance that China attach attaches to it? Well, it's obviously a very important uh, move because uh, um, already said by um, other um, uh, a panelist that Italy is will be the first uh, G7 country uh, to sign this um, and it is an important political gesture. Um, however, um, I wouldn't say this would have immediate um, commercial or, or social uh, implication because um, mem um, MOU does not really refer to any um, clear or a substantial um, business deals. So it is still at the political uh, level, uh, but then of course it has uh, um, important uh, political implications for both China and Italy. Zhao Hai, there will be four Italian ports in line for Chinese investment, and those four ports include Genoa, Palermo, Trieste, and Ravenna. Trieste is of particular importance because, uh, a particular benefit, I should say, for China, because it would give them access to Austria, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and even Serbia. So how important is that for China? Well, I think there are two uh, things we, uh, we have to remind, or to be re reminded. First of all, China has... Um, uh, operating a port in Greece, and so far it has been a successful story. And secondly, China has another mechanism called 16 plus 1, uh, in which China cooperates with uh, Central and Eastern European countries. So by Italy participating in the BRI, China will in expand that picture and having more access to the area in which European countries can do more trade with China. I think China does not want to uh, endanger its relationship with the EU by just signing the MOU with uh, Italy. I think this should be a win-win situation for both uh, Italy as a country and the EU as a whole. Because uh, I think at this point it's about moving forward or moving backward. Uh, at this point, I think uh, signing the MOU by particip you know, participating in the BRI is a strategy for the EU uh, to move forward to upgrade its relationship with China while the world is in danger of protectionism and rising uncertainty. So I think it's really a good opportunity for EU to reconsider about how to connect with China's BRI because they th themselves has their own uh, project of connecting Europe with Asia. So I think it's really 
uh, good for both sides. Uh, the, the concerns, the security concerns, and the concerns about cross-Atlantic relationship should be settled by uh, European countries themselves. And China just want to do the right thing here. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. Beth, the conversation continues online. Join us on CGT in America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show or chat with us on Twitter at CGT in America. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.